All right, so today we're doing file genetics again. You know this. Um, but there's an actual coin you can get. So that's why Britain rules. Right, like a coin with Darwin on it. <coughs> so overall learning goals for today. So talk about your primitive thoughts that I know you all have and that will purge from your head. Um, we'll talk about why tree finding is hard. Okay, securely hard. We'll talk about likelihood versus Bayes, model selection, and bootstrapping. Okay, but first, <coughs> um, here I have a coin, actually I used a penny, where you got heads, heads, tails on the first three flips. I want you to write um, a prediction of over the next 18 flips, how many heads will we get? Okay, um, Rachel's seen this before in class, but yeah. <coughs> heads mean the number of heads side, not the number of heads that are actually on yeah, sorry. So I should have put it up. Yeah, this is a penny. See, so I should have, should have changed the image. So it's a penny, and yeah, it's the probability of getting, you know, on the next 18 throws, do I get. <laughs> um, on the next, yeah, I'll, I'll flip it 18 times, and so if it gets, you know, equal numbers of heads and tails, it'll be 9. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so not, not 18 times the 3. So, um, and we don't want to do any game theory stuff, so um, you'll, if, if one person gets it right, you'll get, you know, three candy bars. If all of you get it right, you'll get three candy bars, okay? So don't try to, like, choose an unpopular number, try to get more candy, <laughs> you know, none of that stuff, okay? <coughs> this allow me to tell, tell, like, what sort of people you are from your guesses. So write your number and your name on, it, on, the, on the post-it. So you said you got three, so you flipped it three nine, and then you got him and his tail? Yes. And I'm going to flip it 18 more times. So I can possibly get zero heads, 18 heads. Are we assuming that it's an unbiased you, It's this penny. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, not, no, it's not a hypothetical penny. It's a penny and it's real chocolate. <laughs> and like you're actually going to do it? Yes, oh. it's actually, I'm actually going to flip it. Is, is this, is it's empiricism. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> What? No, okay, so add the next 15. Right, right. yes. So no, total, total, not like, what's there's the next There's no yeah. run or wrong answer until you actually flip it 18 times. Runner on the answer? And whoever's closest gets handed, that's it. No, 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 you have to get exactly right. <laughs> if you get exactly right, you get... Just guessing a number between 1 and 18. Zero, well, 0 and 18, yes. Based on your knowledge of coins and the fact that it got two heads and one tails on my first three flips. <laughs> You're getting candy. <laughs> 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 Could we answer distribution? <laughs> one number. And I don't need an essay too. I did this in, in, with undergrads, and like someone wrote a whole essay about like, no, just give me the number. Yeah. All right. So do you have the number? <laughs> Yeah. So you can make a histogram using these. <laughs> you need R for everything. It's for joy. Can I make an instrument by a computer? Possible. This is a 9. It could be a G. <laughs> 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 Nine point eight units per second squared. Remember if that's more of you should have gotten that joke. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
right. So at the break, I'll flip, and you'll see what this tells me about you. Okay. <laughs> um, what? Patience. Yeah, you're gonna be in, you're gonna be in grad school for ten years to get your PhD. Yeah. Man, a little sweet. <laughs> 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 All right. <coughs> All right. So first of all, your primitive thoughts. Okay. So a lot of us th have sort of learned about like primitive and um, derived or primitive and advanced species, right? Basal angiosperms, things like that, right? <coughs> and so we see this sort of you know like this great chain of being, right? Of, simple to complex life. <clears throat> okay? This is bad thinking. Okay? It's sloppy, it'll lead you to make mistakes about life. Okay, so I'm trying to clean your brains right now. <coughs> so for example, you might have a tree like this and say, okay, let's see. Oh, this is the advanced guy. Yep, Darwin. And these are primitive bacteria. Okay, so this nice ordering, right? And people will, you know, people who come to the Hoff meetings will have people present a tree like this and say, look, here's a primitive taxon, right? Why isn't it the primitive taxon? Well, you have the same the evolutionary history that all the other guys have. Right. Up to, well, up to this point, it's the same evolutionary history. Uh, no, I mean, like, uh, the, the time. time to yep. evolve that way. Right. So it's, it's had, it had it as long to evolve as this guy has, right? It's not that this is ancestral to him. It's the amount of time, right? And the problem with primitive advanced thinking is that people think that, oh, the ancestral form must have looked like this. Maybe that's been addressing as long as possible, right? So, I mean, so coelacanths <coughs> are sister tetrapods, and they swim upside down in their heads, right? Did our ancestors do that? Possibly, but probably not, mm -hmm. right? Yeah? Uh, there was a question about that. Um, how about molecular clock? This yes. Okay, so that the time run for some people faster than probably. Right, so we talked about this last time. If we have like oak trees evolve slower than daisies, right? And so here's my oak tree, here's my daisy. So this has had, they have the same amount of time, so this has had fewer generations, less amount, amount of change, right? So yeah, it's had, it's had less change for those traits. We still shouldn't say it's primitive relative to the other one, okay? Because it, it could be that the ancestral form is still herbaceous. Uh, yes, yes, no, I mean, uh, but uh, in terms of like, Times they had to evolve because here we assume they had the same time to evolve. Right. So how, how that relates to molecular clock as well? Okay. Yeah. So if they've had the same amount of time to evolve, then under molecular clock, if if the molecular clock is true, which we'll talk about in um, next week at some point, then you should see the same amount of changes through time mm -hmm. on average. Um, but the clock might not be true, like the oak and daisy case. Okay. Another thing you might be thinking about is if here's Archaeopteryx and here's a blue jay. Right? The blue jays have more time to evolve. Okay? But still, the archaeopteryx has, has had time on this branch to have separate traits. And so it's incorrect to assume that the ancestor of the blue jay looked just like the archaeopteryx. It may have had some of the features of the archaeopteryx, but the archaeopteryx might have its own derived traits. Okay? Um, <coughs> but even with, with coeval taxa, things arrive at the same point in time, people will make, this uh, make the mistake of calling this one primitive. Okay. You can say it's sister to everything else. That's true. It's not primitive, the primitive taxon. Right? Here's an example. So let's take this tree, and now let's move Chuck over here. Right? These are hours of programming. <coughs> and you know, now here is a tree of other taxa. Right? <clears throat> this is also a valid tree of life, right? where the derived advanced one is a cockroach. Right? I mean, in some ways, a cockroach has you know, many cool traits that Darwin doesn't. Right? Darwin's head doesn't do as well as a cockroach does. Right? Nice to have that redundancy. <coughs> but you know, they've had the same amount of time to evolve. They could have their own Okay. Yeah? What if you actually managed to find like a direct, like an actual ancestor, not like, like something that would be at one of the diverging nodes? Could you legitimately call that primitive? Yes. However, people in paleontology will tell you you don't find that. So, um, if we find a Homo erectus, you know, fossil, what's the chance that, you know, it, it's offspring led to all of you? It's probably that's, you know, a sister. It might be a very short branch, sister to everything else, but it's probably not the ancestor. And so you assume it's on a little branch. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, because that points to a node. It's like the most recent common ancestor of Darwin and cockroach is this node here. Because those, because you could say primitive or, or ecomorphic traits, right? So, um, <coughs> in, we'll tend to say more ancestral derived traits, okay? That's a property of the traits, right? Not a property of the taxon. And so, you know, we're a mixture of, um, in, you know, ancestral traits for a group, certain groups and derived traits, right? So, so you know, so, you know a trait based on You just find out like a single individual when you talk about the female ancestor, but uh, the population itself could be an ancestor, not right? Right, yeah. the population could be. Yep. Yeah. So you could say, you know, this population is split back here in Africa, and the population went, you know, across to Europe, and the population stay in Africa. Yeah. And so then you could say this population, so, or this edge is accessible to these edges. Especially in terms of tip taxa, this this sort of speech comes up a lot. But the like an ancestral population that derived into two new ones. Mm -hmm. So then this uh, population is the ancestral marriage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Other, good, other questions. Okay. Now finding these taxa or sister, everything else can be very useful. Right, we want to find information about what's happening down here. Well, all this stuff gives us information about this branch. This one gives us information about this branch. It helps us get that answer state better, better estimated. So they're good to get. Okay, but you know you shouldn't assume that they're ancestral by okay. The answers are talking which is not, you know, marry your cousins and go in the sandbox. Right. <coughs> okay. Other questions about this? All right, so, so that's that. So never do that if your advisor tells you to. Um, <coughs> now, why tree finding is hard. Okay, so we're going to start talking about how you build trees. Okay, this is a hard problem. Okay, I want to talk about, a little bit about why it's a hard problem, and I'll get into the details of it. But first, I want to make you sort of afraid of the issue. Okay, and I'll talk about how you can solve it. So here we have a tree of two taxa. Right? There's only one rooted tree of two taxa. If I spin it this way, it's the same tree, right? So I can spin on a node and change the tree at all. Okay. Now let me add a third taxon. Okay. So where could it go? We could go on this branch and create that tree. <coughs> right? People see how that works? Okay. This branch and create that tree, or this branch and create that tree. All right. Now, for the next taxon I want to add, I have five branches to add it to. Okay, so I can create five distinct trees here, and I can do the same thing here and create five distinct trees here that don't overlap with this tree. So, of course, we can go 1, 3, 15. <coughs> All right, so you say 1, 3, 15, 105, n, double factorial. Okay, so a big number, it's big very fast. Okay. And we think about, you know, when you want to say something's growing quickly, we say exponential growth, right? Um, <coughs> so here's exponential growth, it's doubling. Okay. Um, each step. Here's exponential growth, it's increasing tenfold each step. Okay. And here for trees, it's factorial growth. Okay. Three, five, seven. And so here's a log plot, right? We have number of things on the y-axis and the log scale, and then n on the x-axis. And so on this kind of plot, exponential growth is linear, right? Vectorial growth keeps going faster and faster and faster and faster. 
Okay, so it will always, in the end, be even exponential growth. So the number of atoms in the universe is here. Right? So the time you get to, you know, 45 species, there are more possible resolved trees for 45 species than there are atoms in the universe. Okay, Jeremy makes trees of 10,000 species. Right, so there's nowhere. So he's out of room in the universe to store all of them to look at them. Right, to get a few other universes to, to help him. Right, <coughs> and we know there's over a million species on Earth. Okay, so the problem the problem we're trying to solve is so big that the search space is ginormous. Okay, so be afraid. <coughs> One thing we often do with this is to sort of tree search, and we do a heuristic tree search. Okay, so it has some criteria about what makes what makes a tree good. We'll talk about what that is. It could be you know best fits your model of evolution, giving your data. It could be the simplest tree for your data. Okay, some sort of criterion of goodness. And so you have a tree, and you propose a new tree. How do you know if it's better? Okay, so it's sort of like a, a box of chocolates, right? <coughs> and you say, okay, I have this box of chocolates. Which one's your favorite, or which tree is your preferred one? Okay. Um, except that the box is very, very big. And the way you tell is by picking one up, tasting it, putting it back, picking up another one, tasting it, putting it back, and so forth, across this huge space of chocolates. Okay? So not only is the space bigger than the number of atoms, it's a tap taste a lot of them to get there. Okay? So because we do this, this heuristic search that is not guaranteed to give you the right answer. So if it's, if it's a small enough tree, we can look at all the trees. Or if it's a little bigger, we have a branch and bound algorithm that can be guaranteed to give us the right tree. But for a tree that we're looking at in this class, you know, this space is huge. And so finding the absolute best tree in that space can be hard. And so we have shortcuts. We might say, okay, I'm really hating what they have these green lines on them. I'll not eat those anymore. Okay. It could be, though, that this green one is amazing and just looks very different from the others. But you, know, you can't tell that it. So it's just like that. All right, um, tree search is often NP complete, okay, which is a, a class in computer science. Okay, um, <coughs> means that no polynomial time solution to finding the, the right answer. Okay, thus that the complexity of the problem basically grows really quickly. Okay, this particular class of problems is such that it's hard to find the right answer. You can easily tell if your answer is right or wrong. Right, so here's an actual example of an actual NP complete problem. Right, you go into a re restaurant and say, I would like $15 and five cents worth of appetizers. Right. Now I found at least two solutions to it using this. Right, but if I tell you the solution is 12 sampler plates, you can say, no, that's a dumb solution. If I say it's seven um, mixed fruits, you can check it out and go, yeah. It's one of those mixed fruits. <coughs> um, you can easily verify an answer, but you can't find the answer easily. So same thing with trees. I can say, this, you know, there is a tree that has only five changes on the tree. And I can give you that tree, and you can say, yep, one, two, yep, five, great. But to say, OK, there's no tree that has four changes, that's a very hard problem to solve. Okay. Um, <coughs> I can actually skip this part. OK. Um, so here's a tree. Okay. It says here's a tree of thirteen thousand species. It's also German. Why you this? So you require thirty two gigs of RAM to run, just like to hold the data for this tree. Okay, which probably is not on your laptop. Um, <coughs> and it's this you know, enormous tree. Um, and again, think about you know here's sixty taxa. Here's tree space. All right, this is you know, tens of thousands of taxa. Okay. So, on this tree of 13,533 taxa, imagine the search space is the size of campus. Right? And you're trying to find, say, a rubber duck on campus. Okay, so it's a hard problem. Right? It's a big campus, small rubber duck. Adding two more taxa expands the search space such that you're looking for over this over the entire planet. In terms of relative areas, okay. That's so just adding two taxa to that tree it makes the search space blow up that much larger. Okay. So this is a hard problem. Okay. Um, 
to be afraid. Um, even looking at the thing is hard. Okay, so here's a tree of thirteen thousand names. Okay, it's a little st strings of text. Right, your fancy HD TV is nineteen twenty pixels. Right, you're not going to be able to stick thirteen thousand names in nineteen twenty pixels. Look at them. Okay, if you have a tile of computer monitors, you know thirty two hundred pixels. Okay, so it's still not that great. Um, actually, <coughs> one of the people still do, and one of the pictures I showed of on Monday of on Wednesday of Jeremy with him with a magnifying glass and like this, that you print out the trees. Where you can have you know high resolution and you can see and tile together. Right? So everything you need to know about tree vision you learn in kindergarten. Okay? <coughs> so even just visualizing the results to see if they're right can be hard. Right, so I say, so I know Amborella, for example, is sister to the rest of angiosperms. So how can I, I do a new tree search, come up with a tree, how do I actually look at the tree to see if that's right? right just to see, where's that one taxon name? So we have techniques to do this, um, involve stretching and things like that, but it's hard to do. Okay, this is why, you know, inferring trees is hard. Okay? Alright, so likelihood versus, uh, sorry, is there a question? Or is there a question about this? Thirty-two gigs of RAM. Yeah, you can build it. So, like the ones we have in our lab now are sixty-four gigs of RAM. Um, there are high RAM machines that have, I think, you go up to one twenty-eight. One twenty-eight, but very few chipsets. The processor starts limiting you there, so you get a third-party chipset. Yeah. Do you know what processor you're using? Yeah. So you really geek out on computers, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the record, the trees that he showed that we built, um, at the time, we ended up using a Yale, they, they cluster at Yale, and it took like two months. No, it's just one computer and all these games. Yeah, just chugging along. Yeah, chugging along with that. Um, but obviously now, like Brian said, like his lab right up right now, I could run that same tree probably maybe a few hours. Um, so, I mean, things have advanced so quickly in lab, just last few years. Well, at least my lab. Just your lab. You've already had to give up for All right. So now let's go and talk about what kind of people you are. All right. So <laughs> here you have a model, right? And so you have a coin. And I have, you know, this coin has some probability of landing heads, right? So it's a fair coin, probably landing heads is 0.5. I mean, we know this, these guys you know this, right? So let's look at the estimate of Q for this coin. Well, that's what I asked you, right? I said, I'm going to flip it, and what estimate? As you guys all know stats, right? You gave me different answers. You have the same data going in, same coin, and you gave me different answers. So what's leading to that? So we'll talk about what, the, what that means. Okay. <coughs> so basically a Bayesian answers one way, okay, or actually one of many ways. A Friedman answers a different way. If I can tell sort of where you land on this divide. Alright, so let's talk, well, let's talk about what a Friedman just using likelihood would do. Okay. So first choose a model. We'll talk about how you choose models later today. Okay, but let's imagine a simple binomial model. Right, the probability of landing heads is just based on some fixed Q. It doesn't depend on the weather outside, it doesn't depend on anything else, it depends on some innate property of the coin. Okay? Um, so we'll use a binomial distribution for that. So here's a definition. Okay. Likelihood. Right, so this is one of those words that's annoying because it has a common sense English meaning and a precise statistical meaning. Okay, so we're going to use this precise statistical meaning now. So likelihood hypothesis given a data is proportional, often equal to, not necessarily, in drop terms, the probability of the data given the hypothesis. Okay. So that's a lot of words. What does it actually mean? Okay. <coughs> so in our case, the hypothesis is just a given value for Q. So I predict Q is 0.5. That's my hypothesis. Okay. And the data is getting two heads out of three tosses. Those are the data I see. So likely there's a probability of getting two heads out of three tosses 
given that q is 0.5. Okay, so let's make the assumption that q is 0.5 with the probability of observing these data. Okay, so here it was 0.4, right? So I can plug and chug in this function. Okay, probability of getting two heads out of three tosses is this, and two at eight. Okay, if you didn't know math, you could just simulate a bunch of times in R and count them up and get an approximation of that. Right? <coughs> but it's better to just look up. If you, if, you have, if you can do the math, do the math. So, <coughs> we can then say the likelihood of the process Q of 0.4, given the data, is proportional to 0.288. Colloquially, we would probably just say equals 0.288. Okay. So, what it takes is the best estimate of Q, that Q that maximizes the probability of the data. Right? I have the data. So let's take a value that makes it most likely to have gotten those data. That which makes sense. Okay. So in this case, here's the likelihood curve for coin flipping with, with two heads and three three and uh, two heads out of three tosses. Okay. So here's my value of 0.4. That's here's Q. Read up. 0.288. Okay. Here's the maximized. The peak. Right. Right up here. And so we get our estimate. So two thirds. Okay, so what's two thirds of eighteen? Well. So those of you who are frequent tests believe in likelihood would have chosen this. Okay? Most of you aren't. So you could be doing math badly, which is always possible, but you could be doing something else. Right? Right. Or just a we'll get to that. Um, right. So it sort of makes sense, right? So we have a coin that lands two heads two at a time. Two this seems like a reasonable estimate, right? But most of you don't think it's really two thirds. Okay. Um, and so if it weren't a coin, if I gave you some R program that you pressed a button and it said one or zero, and it said one one zero, you say, oh, it's two thirds, right? I show you a coin, unless you chose something else. Okay. <coughs> Another issue is likelihood. Then we turn the probability of the data given the hypothesis. I don't actually care about the probability of the data. I have the data. I care about the probability of the hypothesis. How can I get that? Okay. So we turn that. We can use Bayes' rule. All right. So here's the formula for Bayes' rule. Okay. So probably the data given the hypothesis, what's that? Likelihood, right? Probably the hypothesis. What's that? What? Prior. Your prior, right, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Right. What do we think we have? Um right, so this is a prob what we think the probably of that's some hypothesis is, the coin being 0.4 for heads, without any data. So we already look at the coin and just know something about how I think coins are, what I think the probability of heads is. Okay, on a coin. That's my, so that's my prior belief. Multiply those, those together, okay? And then you can divide by the sum of those across all possible hypotheses. Okay? And together, that gives you the posterior probability, the probability of a certain portion of heads given your data. Okay? So that's Bayes' rule. Now, Bayes' rule itself is not controversial. Okay? It's just conditional probability, which is stuff moved around. Okay? What is controversial is this bringing in some prior belief without even looking at the data. Because okay, your prior belief may be different from mine. Yeah. But the evidence is uh, the probability of behavior. Hmm? The evidence, the numerator, the probability of the data. You're right. Uh, I don't know, maybe what it is. Uh, but, I don't know. Actually, the denominator is probably the data. Right. Yeah. The yeah. That's, that's okay. 
And I did it with, um, yeah, I mean, we did it with sort of discrete hypotheses, but yeah, you integrate for continuous hypotheses, like, like actual probability of heads. I'm just confused with the other probability of the yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other condition probability. But I think now we are more than Yeah. That's just the data. Yeah. Okay. So, look at these priors. So, just to make it easier to plot, I'm assuming a set of discrete possibilities for, for probability of heads, but continuous. Okay. Um, so here's a flat prior. Okay. So it says, I know nothing about coins. So given a, before I flip anything, it could be 0.5, it could be 0, it could be 1, equal probability, I have no clue. Okay. Here's a different prior. I think coins are fair. Okay, so I put a lot of weight on the coin being fair. And the tighter you make this, the stronger weight you're putting on the coin being fair. Okay. <coughs> um, another thing you do is say, I know that coins and stats examples are never fair. Right? So we use this for the prior, right? where I say, it can be anything but fair. And the less fair it is, the more, li more, more likely it is. Okay? <coughs> so these are all priors you could use. And depending on which prior you bring to the, to the analysis, you'll get different answers out. Okay. Okay. So here's our likelihood. Okay. From the likelihood. And then combine them and get our posterior. Right, so after flipping our coin, getting two-thirds heads, well, if I had this flat prior, right, in this case, <coughs> my posterior estimate for the the maximum posterior probability is two-thirds. I had no information going in, the data say two-thirds, I say two-thirds. Okay. Um, <coughs> if I had a prior for it being fair, I moved it over slightly. You can see it's a little over from 0.5. Right? So the fact that I got, you know, more heads than tails suggests that, yes, a little, maybe a little greater chance for it being above 0.5 than below 0.5. Okay? And <coughs> with this weird U-shaped prior, it strongly suggests it's over here. Okay? <coughs> and now, Showing those again. Prior, likelihood, posterior. What happens if I keep flipping the coin? What happens if I keep flipping it and it keeps being two thirds heads? What happens in these scenarios with these different priors? A part of the posterior is move. Yep. So it all start to converge on two-thirds. All right, so you have enough data, <coughs> it will converge on what might be the right answer, okay? For some, for some priors. Now, if I had a prior that said the coin can be, you know, 0.5 or lower, flat prior that went like this, then I could never get to two-thirds. I'd be stuck at it being maximum 0.5, okay? Right, but wouldn't that be an indication that, uh, it would be, but then do you travel back in time and change your prior beliefs? Well, but, what, so you can change your prior beliefs based on right. your observation, but then they're no longer your prior beliefs. So, I mean, if you were a pure Bayesian, you wouldn't do that. If you're a good scientist, I, I, you should do that. You'd say, oh, wow, we're at this weird bound. We should look at our data again and think about things some more, right? But in theory, I mean, you can't say, oh, well, we've got two-thirds. Let's move our prior to the end two-thirds. You put a prior in there for a reason. Um, and we see priors a lot in Bayesian phylogenetics. Okay, so you can put a prior on transition rates. Okay, we'll talk about what those mean in a little while. Um, rate heterogeneity. Branch lengths. Okay, it's been an actually important prior when arguing about um, uh, whether Bayesian approaches work well. The prior on topology. Okay, so this is the shape of the tree. The prior, prior on fossil calibrations. Right, so <coughs> if I don't see, um, right, if I see a fossil of humans two million years ago, when did humans split from chimps? It's 
or sometime before two million years ago, right? How long before two million years ago? It could have been a trillion years ago, right? But maybe I think, okay, it doesn't go up the human fossil record, and it's probably not too much further back than that. Right? So I could put some sort of prior and say, okay, here's two million years. It's not going to be younger than two million years, but maybe somewhat older with some sort of distribution. So we put a prior like that on it. Okay? If I think that I have a lot of good data, maybe it's a higher distribution. Okay? And so you can put the priors on for that sort of thing. <coughs> and so from you know, your work here, I can see the lot of you put a very, very strong prior on coins being fair. So despite having data that, you know, two-thirds heads, you still put most of your weight on being fair. Okay. Some of you have a weird prior where you think, okay, it's two-thirds heads, so I think it's less likely to be fair and so it should be lower than two-thirds, lower than 50-50 heads. Right. And so you have an extreme, more extreme prior here that's past the life period. Okay. But most of you are in sort of this area where you think you have a strong prior on being heads and maybe a little bit weaker and weaker. Okay. And so we can then flip a coin and see who's right. Yeah. How do we reconcile um, not being at a, a whole number, like a, like a multiple of, out, of the number of outcomes? So like giving us three instead of giving us four or two mm -hmm. or six or whatever. Like how, is there some way that you reconcile that in the statistic? Or like is that ever thought about when we think of our, 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 our preliminary data or whatever when we're building this? No, I mean, so, so the data are discrete in this case, and that's what the data are. Yeah, I mean, we'll, and you'll see problems. Right, because you know, you because it, 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 it couldn't be if it were sixty percent heads, you cannot get sixty from flipping three coins. <coughs> right. So, um, yeah, I mean, that that's just a nature of the, that's the nature of the problem. If you see the same things, we're looking at models for species diversity. Right, if we assume species are a thing. I can have one species or 20 species, I can't have 20 and a half species. Okay. Good. Other questions about this? Okay. So this tension between, you know, whether or not to use priors comes up a bit in phylogenetics, both in terms of building trees and also some of the techniques for using trees. Okay. And it's sort of a thing where I've been trying to get people to fight about it, but people don't. They sort of use both or use whatever's easier to use and as a sort of philosophical, you know, it's convenience sort of thing. Um, so what's your argument? Well, I can't tell them that. They're the learning stuff. Yeah, they develop it, develop it themselves. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, I'll, I'll teach you facts, opinions you can drive yourself. Maybe later I'll tell you, but of course I want you to sort of fight amongst yourselves and sort of work through these ideas. Okay. Yeah. So obviously with these major Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You you could use it. I don't know if it is used as much in ecology. Even. Yeah. 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 I mean, you could see it being used. I mean. But, I mean, you do have prior knowledge in ecology, one hopes. And so it's, it is a nice way of incorporating prior information. So, I mean, one thing that it could be used for that's not used much yet is if I think, okay, I think that um, my prior belief for the, you know, I think 60% of the time invasive species cause harm to the environment. Okay. And now I do another study of a new invasive species. Well, how do you combine your observation with the existing data? Well, you could do it in a Bayesian way and say, okay, at first we have, you know, this distribution for, you know, how much invasive species hurt, and now I've added and changed it, so now I think it's 65% chance. Okay? And if there's been a ton of studies, your data point doesn't move very much. If there's been one study, your data point moves a lot. Okay? There's actually people think that, pe that one way of learning, how, how humans learn, is a sort of Bayesian approach. All right? So the sun keeps rising. Okay, I don't need to, you know, my, my, my belief about the sun rising tomorrow is not a flat prior. I have this, I have this strong belief the sun's going to rise tomorrow. Right? Um, <coughs> whereas getting a nature paper 
you don't have a lot of data about that, you know, so they have some sort of flat prior, depending how optimistic or pessimistic I am, have different priors. <coughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the example for insufficient data? What? We, we could actually never, could not assume it's a fair coin. So we have to react on something. You can, you can still assume it's a fair coin. Yeah, but I mean, purely data would be fair. Right. Yeah. Right, so, so, the, so the MLE is never going to be 50 50 with, with three flips. Yes. Yeah. So, isn't that an example of bad data set? Then? Uh, why would it say be bad data set? In one, once it's a very small sample size. Yes, I mean that that a bad data. Yeah, and uh, it doesn't allow all the assumptions. Or, or not. It's, it's, uh, uh, what did I say? That's kind of what I was trying to ask earlier. Like, okay. This three flips only allows a, a third, two thirds, or pure chance. Or like zero, zero or three, zero yeah. And, uh, and so, how is that built into the assumptions we make in these models? Like, is there some way where we say, well, just because this is what we have, and we don't have anything else, the coin exploded after the third flip. It's like all we have. Yeah. We're like magically getting a clone of that coin. we like test. But is there some way you can incorporate that into your understanding, knowing that you didn't give it? Nothing for shot to get that. Is, is that perfect for you know two and two or anything like that? Where does that build in? I guess? Yeah. So I mean, if we're just doing frequent tests and we, I mean, <coughs> um, yeah, I mean, the still so Your data is discrete, but you don't build into that in any way. You're stuck with the insufficient data, and so that you can't tell between point six. And Well, what should happen is if you have very little data, then it starts to be flat. Right? So the difference between it being 0.5 and 0.67 isn't a very big difference. Right. Okay. If I had a thousand slips and two thirds heads, then my likelihood is much peakier. And so there's ways to do that. And so one sort of rule of thumb is if you're doing the log of week space, you can go down and if there's a likelihood access in all points within delta two log of week units, rule of thumb. And so it could be at first, it's actually from zero to one. If it flips a lot, this would become much tighter and it would be, you know, from 0.66 to 0.68. Okay, so model selection. Okay. <coughs> so for example, here I have a set of models, right? Probably of heads 0.5, probably of heads 0.67, probably of heads 0.5 times plus the coin mass over the average coin mass. I think heavy coins tend to be heads more, right? Here I've done the model where it's um, probably of heads is 0.5 or something, whether it's you know heads up or heads down when I first flip it. Okay, so all the different models. Model selection is about picking a model. Okay. Why do we want to bother picking a model? So what's wrong with over-parameterizing? I think my data really well. And then we have another data set from the same true distribution, and we'll do a bad job explaining those data. Right. 
So you want a model that explains the data well, but doesn't overfit the data or underfit the data. Okay. Um, <coughs> sometimes also our biological question is about the model. Right? So is there just drift in the system, or do we have selection towards an optimum? Right? Um, that's a comparison of models. Right? You could also think of it as a, a, a parameter estimation question. Is S zero, or is it significantly bigger than zero? Okay, and oftentimes, these model comparisons can be sort of thought of as parameter estimation questions, too. Is this exactly zero, or is this exactly equal, or not? Okay. That's for only certain sets of models, not models like that. All right, so these two models aren't restrictions of each other. They're different models. Right. And so I can't <coughs> change one to the other by changing some, by making something zero, making something equal. Okay, still not nested. So how do we compare models in general? Well, one way is a likelihood ratio test. Okay, so in example, we're going to talk about what these models mean. Basically, if we're looking at DNA evolution, we have a whole set of nested models. What you can do is compare these models that differ only by a parameter. Okay. So in the simple model, these two parameters are equal. The more complex models are allowed to vary. And you can see if the benefit I get from the letting vary is worth the cost in terms of having more parameters. We did a the ratio test. Okay. Um, if the chi square distribution, or you know, if they're at a boundary of 20 or chi square distribution. Okay. Now the problem with this is it requires nesting. Okay, so in the previous example here, since this model isn't nested within this model or vice versa, I can't compare them with the likelihood ratio test. Um, <coughs> and also there is this sort of greedy approach you go down or go up. And depending on which way you do, you can get different answers. Okay. Um, so now we tend not to use likelihood ratio tests as much. Okay. They're still used in some areas because it gives you a p value from the chi square distribution, and people love p values. Okay. Nice low p value. Um, <coughs> this is sort of appropriate for thinking about rejecting null hypotheses, right? So if I'm going to reject this model for this model, you have p value for rejecting that. Okay. A different way to select models is using the Akiki information criterion. Okay. <coughs> and so what this does is use an estimate of the information loss in different models. Okay. And you try to minimize the information loss. Okay. And there's complex information theory underlying it, but the actual value is very easy. So the parameter is minus twice the left If you can plug it very easily, there's actually corrections for small sample size and things, because this is an approximation. We'll get to later. Um, <coughs> and one important thing about AAC is we, what you do is then compare the relative information loss. Right? So I'm saying how far are we from Boston? Right? So Jeremy is about 15 feet closer to Boston than I am. Okay? Now, how far is it actually to Boston? You now is it a thousand miles or two thousand miles? Doesn't matter. Jeremy's fifteen feet closer, he's a better model. Okay, if, try, if our goal is to get to Boston. Boston's the truth. Should be the Ayers Hall. Let's see. Okay, Ayers Hall. Um, okay. So the advantage of this is it doesn't require nested models. Okay. All you need to do is go compare information loss in different models. You know, it doesn't require nesting at all. Okay. It also allows model weighting. Okay. Let's say I find that two models are about equally good. Okay. I can say, okay, let me draw my inferences under a mixture of this model and that model. Okay. And that way you sort of integrate over this model uncertainty. The problem is it doesn't give you a p-value. For those of you who like p-values, this isn't a way of rejecting things. Right? So we have rules of thumb. So if de delta AC is less than 2, the models are about equal. If between 4 and 7, one's better. If it's greater than 10, one's a lot better. Okay? There's not significance. Okay? So it's not really a model of rejection. It's just trying to fit the models that best explain your data. So the length of the ratio test, it does require Right. Yep. So this doesn't require any signals. Yeah. 
you actually said, from like a great depth, that depending on how you, in which direction you compare, you get different results. You could get different but results, yeah. that, But that isn't possible then, but because one has to be bigger than the other one, and then you have a negative degree of freedom. And then one so, if here is model complexity, right? So complex, simple. It could be that A versus B is significant. B versus C is not. B versus C is. And so if I start off with the simplest and go here, is C better than B? Not significantly, I don't go up. If I go this way, go to D and C, okay, so I might uh, here I choose D. Right, so if I start and do this comparison first, I choose D, and this comparison first, I choose D. Because you don't go through the whole string. You stop. Oh, sure. you, you could, you don't. In, with likely ratio tests, you compare these, these pairs of nested models. But you, then you still see the other life in there? I mean, wouldn't you compare the, the ones that have that life here? Just... So the ones that have the, the, so if they're nested, the one that's most complex will have the likelihood that's as good or better than anything else. Right. They actually have more parameters to yeah. So if, if the truth were um, parameter x equals parameter y, well, I can fit that in a complex model that has x and y independent, yeah. or I can find that in a model where x e must equal y. Right. Yeah. So you're always, so the best, best model is always going to be d. Yeah. With like the average test, though, you typically you do this comparison or this comparison. You don't do this, and then this, and then this. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. You're put correct from the testing. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. It, we always do. We them all. Yeah. In phylogenetics, people don't. They just go one way or the other and stop. Okay. Yeah. Whereas with AIC, we get the AIC for D, the AIC for C, the AIC for B, the AIC for A, the AIC for E, which is over here, AIC for F, which is over here, and G. And you compare all of them at once. And one issue with phylogenetics is, so you might be able to restrict D to be C, but you also possibly restrict D to be E, but E and C aren't the same. They aren't nested. Yeah. They can keep going. Good question. Okay. So AIC. We'll talk about AIC later where we actually use some methods to look at trade evolution. Okay, now that's a common news approach. <coughs> okay, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Okay, and this is a way of inf and this is a way to infer posterior probabilities, right? So if I think about Bayes' rule, right, the probability of <coughs> hypothesis given data times probability hypothesis over all of that, across everything. Right? Well, this could be hard to sum up, right? Because something a bunch of infinitely, it could be an infinite set of models. And so, <coughs> MCMC is a computational algorithm that gets you a good estimate of this. Okay? And the way it works is sort of like if I put you in a hat store, okay, and said, I want to figure out what you like in hats. Right? It's, you know, f you know, like, you know, do you like cowboy hats, do you like pink hats, do you like hats with feathers? Okay, <coughs> so one way to do that is to try every hat in the store on you and have you rank, rank them, okay? And that would work. It would take a while, right? <coughs> MCMC is a different approach. What you do is you go in the store and I put a hat on you. I say, walk around the store. If you find a hat you like better, put it on, which hats. Find a hat you like worse, if you really hate it, don't put it on. If you hate it somewhat worse, Roll some dice. If the answer you get is, you know, if the difference in how you like it is less than the dice roll, 
then try to tr put the other hat on, the, the worst hat on, okay? And walk around the hat store doing this. Now, at first, of course, the hats you put on are the hats you first saw at the entrance. All right, so this is, you know, starting sample issue. But after you walk around enough, you know, by the amount of time you have different hats on your head, the, rel your, the rel relative weight for them, how much you like them relative to other hats. Okay? <coughs> and so then it can pick out things like, okay, so you've had a green hat on half the time, so whatever of those green hats is 50%. You've had green cowboy hats on 10% of the time. Okay, so the possibility for a green cowboy hat is 10%. Okay. That's assuming you've walked around the store enough and have done you know, good mixing and things like this. Okay. Um, if you stay in one place and don't put around another hat, you're not doing a good job. Okay. If you're... <coughs> um, so that's basically his MCMC approach. Yeah? At what point do you stop walking around the store? That's a great question. And so with these MCMC approaches, the guys approach it to figure out exactly when you can stop. Because right? there's no natural stopping point. So if we had a thing of trying every hat on in the store once, that's the natural stopping point. Right? With this stuff, there's no natural stopping point. We use this for sort of thing for looking at trees, right? And the thing thinking about how big tree space is, you're not going to try on every tree. Right? So there's some way of stopping. And so we have criteria. So one way is looking at the effective sample size. So how many hats we look at overall given the, the, the correlation we looked at. Maybe if you look at say 50, you're done. So we're looking at it. If you if I put you in one store and then put your identical twin in the same taste in the same store later and see how how much, you know, when do you guys converge on how liking the same hats? I mean once you're close enough in preferences, then okay, you flip look the store well enough. No. But the risk of that then there might be like some awesome hat, you know, some like pink hat with glowing stars and things that's not like anything else, right? If you haven't happened to hit on that, then you're not going to estimate that possibility. Yeah, so that's why it can be a issue. Yeah? So you take the metaphor, just, are you allowed to put the same hat on for more than once? Yep. So yes, yeah, memoryless. So yeah, so Markov chain um, means where you go depends on what, where you are right now. There's no memory to it. And Monte Carlo means Vegas style. So Monte Carlo used to be you know, a big gambling place, right? So now, of course, they gambling with Vegas style instead. That's all it means. So it's just, it's just like is this done like every yeah. Right, so that's the identical twin thing. So you've been in different places. There's also approaches where you can have an identical friend who's sort of a little tipsy, and so they can wander around and be a little looser about trying on different hats. And so that way you don't get stuck in the baseball cap section. Okay. Your friend might <laughs> go over to the cowboy hat section and then, whoa, these are awesome! <laughs> and then it can bring you over there. As long as you don't hop over bad parts of hat space or tree space, you better search this area. So that we, call, we call that um, uh, mobile chain Monte Markov, no, mobile chain Markov chain Monte Carlo MCQ, where you have these heated chains that are, you know, buzz different strengths. Go so over new valleys and hat space or tree space or fringe space. Yeah. <coughs> uh, this is the same as like, so I thought this was something for like a Monte Carlo simulation where it ran something a thousand times and came to some competition range with that. No, I mean, it's, it's that's just Monte Carlo in terms of just the, the Vegas style sense, just simulating a lot of times. It's just that sense. This is a particular algorithm, which is a class of Monte Other stuff we should hit about this? Uh, that was pretty good. Yeah. I'll always have the drunken Brian. We're getting cowboy hats with this. Excellent. Um, and there's also something called reversible jump, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So that was just sort of estimating these parameters, okay, these probably these hypotheses. If one to hop from one model to another, it's really like going from one hat store to another hat store. Okay, so I compare that to pop, and so the amount of time I spend in each hat store tells me how much I like each hat store, right? And then within the hat store, I can figure out which parameters or which hats I like. Okay? <coughs> and so a lot of approaches now do the, uh, attempt to do this sort of thing, 
right? But in the same way that you know, wandering around the hat store seems hard, wandering around German hat stores is even harder, right? Especially you know, you hop from here to here, you end up in a very that, you know, here you're in this wonderful area of, of pink cowboy hats. You walk over here, and now you're back in the baseball cap section, right? And so it'd be hard to make that move. Okay, so the way to do the search well. <laughs> It's a shopping disaster. <laughs> Which hats do I like better? Oh my god, the hats are like better. Exactly. This is phylogenetics. It's all about shop shopping for hats. Okay. Other questions about model selection? Okay. Bootstrapping. Okay. So with Bayesian approaches, you can estimate the relative probability for different trees, different parameters, things like that. Um, bootstrapping is an older approach that lets you estimate relative weight of support for different parameters too. Okay, so way back in the dark ages, 1985. Okay, <coughs> so you do analysis. You know, go you go out, you get your you know ten amino acids, you know, laboriously or something like that, or your measurements of traits. And you say, okay, here is the tree, right? And they'll like, say, oh, how sure you are of it? This is the tree. And so there's no way to get confidence, really. Okay? And so <coughs> Felsenstein, who came up with half of what we're learning in this class, came up with, borrowed from stats, actually, an approach called bootstrapping. Okay? And it's saying that, you know, we should probably look at confidence. So, <coughs> in general, we, we can do this in general, we have an unknown distribution. Right? So, if we had normal distribution, we knew that the trees were distributed normally. We could you know, plug and chug in various formulas to figure out the SD and all that sort of stuff. It's a confidence interval, right? Well, trees, I mean, there's this weird discrete parameter thing, right? So we don't know what the distribution should be. Um, <coughs> we could do it, but we do have sort of many independent samples from this distribution, right? Each character we look at is a sample that's evolved on the tree, supposedly independently, okay? And the idea is that these samples are an approximation to the distribution. So we can treat these samples as the distribution. We can find out the uncertainty by looking at sampling from the set of samples. So, for example, here I have two different true distributions. Okay? This nice sort of normal shaped one and this flat one. Okay? I don't see those. Those are the, the absolute truth. But I do get our samples from these distributions. Okay? So I'm Pulling stuff at random, you know, I'm just sequencing things or look, measuring measuring traits. Okay. <coughs> then I get this set of samples from this distribution. And this set. Oh, and so here's the mean for that. And this set from this distribution. Third lectures take hours to prepare, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so with that distribution, right? With bootstrapping, what I do is sample with, with replacement from these distributions. Is that okay? I know what the true distribution is, but an estimate of it is this distribution. Let me draw another distribution from this distribution and use those distributions to analyze my data. Okay, as my data. <coughs> so I do it again. Okay, and note, I'm pulling from just these samples, not from this. All I see is your data. Okay, and I do that and then get this mean. I can do it with this one. Okay, I can get that mean. And then I can repeat. I'm not going to draw it in a minute. I am going to draw the animations. And again, it's pretty similar. And here it's going to move over a little bit more. Okay. And so I get this. And I can keep repeating this process, and I get these set of samples, right, where each time I generate a new pseudo replicate data set, okay, analyze it the same as this data set, and see what I get for the answer. Okay, so when you look here, this is what you mean. Here, I have a large range of means with these constructed data sets. Here, I have a pretty tight clustering of these means. Right? And so, <coughs> and again, remember, we don't see these on the top. Okay? So, even though we don't know the true distributions, we want the estimates for the first set are more precise than for the second set, okay, whatever we're measuring. Okay. Um, now, again, for, 
for trees, we actually have, you know, say, DNA sequences. Right? Rather than doing the mean, I can do the best tree under some criterion. And I can see, do I get, you know, when I do sample these columns of placement, do I get a cluster of trees, the same tree each time? Do I get the wide range of trees? And that's the way we, we can estimate uncertainty in our tree. Yeah? Jackknifing is sampling without replacement. Who's dropping sampling with replacement? And <coughs> this is also, I mean, the technical term for this is non parametric bootstrapping. Parametric bootstrapping is rather than sampling your data set, you simulate your data set. You use those simulated data sets instead. Okay, yeah? How do you do that? How do you choose what to simulate? For the, for the, for the parametric bootstrapping, you mean? Or for the non parametric? So for the parametric bootstrapping, you would estimate your parameters. Um, so we have a model of um, you know, DNA changes and also the tree model. And you can simulate under those models, under that model, and then reanalyze your data again and see if you get the same tree factor. Right, but like, how do you, how do you pick those points? Do you just like randomly pick points within the range? For, for, for the simulation part or for the regular yeah. bootstrap? You, you have your observed data that you went out and got. Right. And you just use those data to estimate. So I could estimate the proportion of A, T, G, and C's. That could be my model. Right. And I could simulate it again using that, that observed proportion. And see if I get the same tree back. Or, or some other printer. So we'll, we'll talk more about what the models are. So the old model will have the observed data. And the results got captured. Yeah. Now the problem with that is your model is probably far simpler than the actual data. And so, you know, I've done this with phylogenetics, and you'll find that the real data, if you put it into a tree search program, it'll take a while as it works, works around trying to find the best trait. The simulated data, mm, right up. Right? The simulated data evolved under one tree, nice simple data, nice simple model fits your actual model really well, so you get the tree back. It's not a very hard search problem. With the actual tree space, it's probably this lumpy thing with all these valleys and islands and things like that. And so, <coughs> your simulated data actually is probably too simple. And actually, one thing you can do is something called model adequacy testing. Right? And so, if your model is very much like your real data, then your simulated data should taste like your real data in some way. Right? So, in terms of how long it takes to get the tree, or your parsimony score, or your proportion of A's, with other summary stats, if your real model, if your models match the real data model well, you should be indistinguishable. Right? If your model is not a good fit for the data, you should find that you know your simulated data look different in some way from your real data. Okay. Other that, we're now starting to do in phylogenetics, but we're just sort of starting it. Um, other questions about this? Yes. Model selection tells you sort of which model is best. Model accuracy tells you is your model good enough. Okay. And bootstrapping is the way of just look, looking at the uncertainty. Um, so Bayesian approaches also give you this some sort of measurement of uncertainty in different trees. So this tree has this much posterior probability. This tree has this much posterior probability. Okay. So soil seems similar to bootstrap, but it's different in some ways. So Asian uses original data, bootstrap uses new simple data. Okay. Gives you probabilities of ultimate trees. Okay. This can give you support with just one character. Um, so if I have you know one character that strongly says, so for example, if I have a data set um, where everything is Zero 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 for one clade, and one 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 for every for another clade. I might have a very low rate of evolution. Okay, so if I estimate that low rate of evolution, the fact that I have this one change here under Bayesian approach, there's a lot of support for the two two clades here. Under Bootstrap approach, though, by chance I might miss that one character. Okay, and so a third of the a third or two thirds of the time I'll miss that character and not get that tree back. And so I have so I need to have at least three of those characters. Even 95% support, whereas the Bayesian approach 
depending on the race, if you have just one character. Okay. Um, this gives you plus your probabilities. Bayesian bootstrap doesn't give you sort of sort of sort of like almost an incredible interval, not quite. Um, rules of thumb. Bayesian, 95% is considered good. Bootstrap over 70% is considered good. This is from one paper published in 93, I think. It's a simple paper. This is from you know, people looking at other data sets and saying, oh, that's about equal. This plate has series of bootstrap that only have from Bayesian, maybe they're about equal. And they're measuring different things. Um, this requires a Bayesian approach. This you use generally. Okay. You can even do this with a Bayesian approach. You can bootstrap your data and then run a Bayesian analysis with it again. No one does that, but it'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Good. Yeah. Is it? Yes. So, I'll go back. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, a character here is a column, and then the state is you know A or T or C. Yeah. So. With bootstrapping, you, you sample characters. Yep. So if I had a case where, you know, I had everything identical, except for, you know, if this were, um, yeah, if I have, you know, a C with G, B, C with C, repeated in a few of those. So if I had just one of those, then under bootstrap, I might not get that analysis. I might miss it. The Bayesian would always see that. So it has a low rate overall, and always sees this difference. All the difference is very likely to evolve twice. It's evolved just once. Okay. And here's the jargon about bootstrapping with non-parametric versus parametric bootstrapping. So if you hear someone in file genes talk about bootstrapping, she or he means non-parametric bootstrapping. So that's a lot. Um, so what we've covered is likelihood, Bayes, right, model selection, primitive thinking, right, <coughs> um, bootstrapping. Okay. Any questions on any of that? All right. Let's take a break while I flip coins, and then you come back, and maybe we'll have candy. And then you also have Jeremy.